Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for sticking with us and joining us on the final day. Um, those who are here in present and then also who, who are watching us remotely, you should be in the cycle of two steps forward and one step back. Um, the case study of One Foundation's race, equity, diversity, and inclusion journey. My name is Tanisha Ford, and I get the honor of serving as the executive director of Kaufman Scholars, which is a post-secondary success program funded by the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation. Good morning, thank you for joining us. I'm Veronica Solis Galicia, and I am the Race, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Project Specialist at Kaufman Foundation. And last but not least, I hope, I'm Corey Scholes. I'm the Director of Education at the Kaufman Foundation. And our conversation today, we wanna kind of, our hope is that if you all are thinking about embarking on your race and equity journey, you can learn a little bit from our mistakes and some of the things that we're proud of. Um, and we want to make it a little less scary because we think sometimes people are just afraid to start this journey. And so we're going to give you at first just a timeline of what we've been doing. And then we're going to talk about some of our big wins and some of our big losses um, with the idea that at the end you can ask any questions you want if it's helpful to getting your organization on your journey. So I'm going to start with a little bit of a timeline for you, high level, what we've been doing so you can have a little more detail. But we started this in 2018, and we started it, it was very interesting, and philanthropy, we go to a lot of conferences with other philanthropic leaders, and I was hearing a lot of conversation about philanthropy was going to hold our grantees accountable. We wanted them to have more diversity on their boards. We wanted them to have more race and equity language in their mission statements and things. But I never heard any conversations about philanthropy holding itself accountable, only holding our grantees accountable. And so I thought, this is very interesting, something that we do all the time that's not the right way to do it. And so um, an organization called Promise 54 gave a data dump kind of about what was the state of what people thought about their race and equity in the um, nonprofit sector. And so I was listening to the data, lots of data, nothing surprising. Most people, it was not diverse. People didn't feel good about it. And I thought, well, that's great, but what are we gonna do about it? We have to do something about it. Just telling us the data didn't seem to be helping at all. So we put together an idea to have something called the Accelerator that my foundation hosted. We had 57 organizations from all over the whole country come, and basically people gave their data, and then they had to make a plan of what they were gonna do with their data, and then you get a year's worth of coaching from a race and equity coach to kind of get people started. And I was like, how are we gonna host this and have all of our grantees come and we're still not participating? That did not make any sense to me. So I went to our HR department and was like, hey, I feel like this is really not congruent with what we're saying. I feel like we should be in it. And I got a whole lot of, <laughs> no, we're not gonna be in that. That's too scary. And I'm like, we can't have our grantees accountable if we're not gonna do it. So, I conned them, basically, into letting us participate in this. And in full transparency, myself and another white woman picked the team that we're going to go, which is already a wrong step. But it was the step we made, so I'm telling you. And we, these lovely women, we picked a team of six people that were going to go. We tried to make it diverse across job titles, across races, across all these things, and we, we went to the accelerator. The interesting part is the, our friend, who we love, um, from the HR department didn't come. She didn't show up. So here we were, without any leadership, any senior leadership at the whole thing. Most people had their CEOs with them. One of the things in the accelerator is you make a plan, and then you get two rounds of feedback from a like organization. And both of the organizations we were with had their CEOs, and we had nobody from senior leadership even present. So... That was great, they were all like, are you sure your people are buying this? We're like, no, not really, maybe, kind of. Um, but we made a plan without anyone, and then we got to tell them, hey, you guys, we made the, the, the plan, and they were like, you made a plan? We're like, yeah, that was part of the whole experience was to make a plan. So then we got a year to do our plan, um, and we got buy-in. We, we got buy-in, and we got help and support from senior leadership 
but not at the beginning. And so the accelerator and our, we, we decided for our year's worth of coaching, we were going to kind of do vocabulary building. We didn't even think we had a common enough vocabulary about race and equity work amongst the six of us to even think about having conversations with, the, with our whole foundation. So we read documents and had discussions and talked to each other about like, what does this mean to you? Because this is how I see it. What does this mean to you? And we really spent a year building relationships with each other. Um, there was a lot of side eyes at the beginning. <laughs> we did not trust each other. We did not know each other. I mean, having these kind of discussions gets you to know people super quickly in a super different way. Um, and we needed that. We needed to build trust amongst us before we started with the whole foundation. Would you guys add anything to the, like, the 2018 story? No. <laughs> no, okay. So that was, our, that was for a whole year. That was 2018. We did an entire year of reading and getting to know each other. And it was painful because that doesn't feel like we've done anything. Um, and so then in 2019, we were like, oh, we really need to like, get some steps moving. We're just having a lot of discussions, but nothing's happening. And I think we quickly realized that we couldn't do this work ourselves. We needed a consultant. We needed people who actually know this work to help guide us and coach us through it. So we interviewed a bunch of folks and we hired the Equity Lab. Um, if you don't know our friends, Michelle Molitor and Aaron Trent Johnson, they're amazing women. And they helped us kind of get a plan, think through maybe what first steps would be. And we started leading some professional developments for our whole foundation. And I would say they were a solid C minus on a good day because um, we still didn't really know what we were doing, but we were trying. We were really trying to make sure that we were not just talking, but that we were doing something. Um, but Michelle and Aaron helped us do something that was what I think the best thing that we ever did. And they did what's called a listening tour. So lots of times at the foundation, if we want your opinion, we do a survey and somebody from evaluation writes really weird questions that you don't really know how to interpret and then you answer it and then you get some really benign data that's not personal and that most people lie about because they're afraid that you actually can see their email address and they're not telling you the truth and so you get data that's not that helpful. For the listening tour, this was a one-on-one -on -one in someone's office with Michelle or Aaron who don't work at the foundation and they basically said, what's your story? How, how do you feel as an employee here? And of the 26 pages of data that we got back, some highlights that I can remember were people referring to our culture as sneakily toxic, people saying that they experience microaggressions every single day at our foundation, um, that there are two completely different experiences for people at our foundation, one for white people and one for other people. Um, and I don't think leadership was ready to have that document. And it was the best thing we ever had because our CEO, who again, we love and support fully, I think when she read that, she was like, this is the organization that I lead, this is how people feel? Oh my God, no. Um, because she hadn't been in our discussions up until that point, until the listening tour results came back. Um, someone will talk a little bit more about the listening tour later, but. If you do something like this, it's really important to get the data out in a timely manner, because we also then wanted to scrub this data or maybe not have all the data come out or maybe have conversations about who has access to the data and for how long should this data live and all these other things, because it's terrifying. I mean, the things that were said were terrifying. They actually didn't surprise anyone on this stage, but I think they surprised a lot of people that work there, and so that, for me, was the, the most important thing we ever did was to get an honest picture about what, our, what people really think at our foundation. Would you add anything to that, ladies? That about sums it up. <laughs> Listening to her was everything in the journey, so. I just wish you guys could have been there when they read it. They, they presented it to all of us at the same time, and people's eyes were like, that's what that says? It's like, yes. Um, so with that in hand, now we have this beautiful 26-page document. We formed, so we had our six-person team, but then Michelle and Aaron really pushed us to form what's called the Ready Change Team, which is a bigger team that Veronica will talk a little bit more about later. Um, 
to get the message more off of our shoulders, just like this was something, some project the six of us were doing, and make it more that this is something our foundation believes in and needs to be done foundation-wide. Um, so that was 2019. So everything I've told you took two years to do. That's it. We did like consulting, some bad PD, and a listening tour, and that's what we did in two years, because it takes so much time. And I'm saying that hopefully to encourage you that if you're trying to do this work and it's taking a lot of time, it takes a lot of time. Um, and then it was time for our, we finally committed in 2020, we were gonna have one day a month, full day sessions for the entire foundation on race and equity work. And I should have said at the beginning, we call it ready. It's race, equity, diversity, inclusion. We make race first because it's the part of the conversation that most people try to not talk about. And DEI work isn't the same as ready work, which you're saying, no, we're specifically gonna call out what race does in this conversation. And so that's why we call it ready work. But our first ready session, there was a snowstorm and we closed the foundation and we didn't have it. And then three weeks later, COVID came. And so here we were set for this whole year's worth of monthly PDs that we were gonna do nine to five race and equity work. And now we were all at home. We're still at home, by the way. We don't go back till September. So. Not one of these race and equity sessions we're gonna talk about have we ever had face-to-face. -face. And why I think that's super important is because, well, it wasn't intentional, obviously, but I think it's actually been beneficial to us because having a conversation, a really difficult conversation about race, when you're in your PJs, in your room, where you're comfortable, on a screen, is very different than if I'm six inches from Tanisha and we're about to have some super hard conversation and I feel her energy and she feels mine and she don't like me and I don't like her and now we're about to have this conversation. And so we're, we're actually kind of nervous about when we come back in September and we're still doing these things monthly because we've never had them face to face. They've always been uh, on a computer. So I'll, I'll, we'll come back next year and <laughs> see, tell you how that goes because we don't know. But we have had for an entire year once a month, all day, nine to five sessions led by a consultant. Again, get a consultant. Um, and one of the biggest things we changed at the beginning was to go to caucus groups. So we were doing lots of whole foundation learning together, which typically meant white people were continuing to harm BIPOC people as we were learning and re-traumatizing folks over and over and over again as we were saying stupid things and then we got smart and someone's like, hey, maybe you shouldn't do this as a whole group. Maybe you should have the white people in that room. And now we have a black caucus, an intersectional caucus, a BIPOC caucus, and a white caucus. Um, and for context, when we started, when we did the accelerator in 2018, we had 113 people that worked at our foundation and 94 were white. So the white caucus is giant. How many people are in your caucus? I think there's about 15 in ours. It's a smaller number. Intersectional? I'm not sure about the intersectional. What about? Um, BIPOC is about 13. Yeah. Mine's like 70 people. Fun. Um, so we did, we started caucus groups in 2020. And then kind of the biggest thing we did is Veronica. She actually changed jobs. She has a whole job now. She's the first person ever in our foundation's history to have a job that is centered on race and equity which is awesome, and she's amazing at it. And we're looking, we're, we're right now interviewing, I actually got an email, we have three interviews next week for a senior level role that will report directly to the CEO that will be in charge, hopefully, <laughs> soon, of stringing all this work together. Because currently it's still kind of the six of us on this small team, we do the work we can, but it was typical, as I think about it, it was just a whole nother job we had that no, nothing was taken off our plate to do this work. It was just added to our plate, which again means the quality is not gonna be great because no one's taking it seriously by saying, oh, now half of your job is race and equity work, half of your job is the other work. That never happened. So she's the first person who actually has an entire job dedicated to this work, which has made all of the difference in 2020 because everything's actually coordinated, thoughtful. Um, we get feedback on it. She makes sure that it's all good. So. So we did all those things in, in 2020. Um, then we had an equity audit from Beloved Community, which is an organization that's here 
if you haven't met Rhonda Burchard, she's somewhere. Um, but the equity audit is the beginning of actually looking at our internal practices, processes, and procedures to see how we're doing. Um, we're not doing very well. But we are going to use that data in the next year to really kind of interrogate some of the things. Because again, we haven't, we've done the easy stuff. We've done the things that are check the box, get it going, easy stuff. And it's hard to do the easy stuff. But we haven't done any of the big stuff that's going to make our whole foundation a different place. And so I think if we did the listening tour again, we'd get some different results, but I think we'd still get a lot of different results because we haven't changed the major things yet. But, but there, it is coming. Um, then I think the last thing I'd say about what we did in 2020 is really just starting to... I think we have different conversations around the foundation. Um, just in general, the way people talk to each other, the way people communicate with one another. I would say our COVID policies were the most generous, thoughtful, <laughs> like we had carte blanche to make sure that people were whole and safe and well. And I don't think any of that would have happened prior to doing all of this work. I think we would have been like, yeah, still come to work because we need you to work. Um, and we, we really got a lot of leeway to make sure. What did Aaron call our special days? Which ones? Our <laughs> low expectations of work. Oh, Lou days. Lou days. Low <laughs> L-E-W. We had certain days that if you just were like, I can't do it today, he's like, take a Lou day. Low expectations of work. It was genius. Um, but again, all those things happened because we committed to looking at one another as people first rather than employees. And that's made, I think, a significant difference. So that's a lot of words I've said. That's kind of the timeline of where we started and where we're going. And hopefully, if we really did come back in a year, we'd have more things to say about how we hire people, how we make grants, how we do things like that, because none of that big stuff has changed yet. But V, do you want to tell us some good things that we've done? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Corey. I'll try not to repeat anything that Corey has already mentioned, but um, I'm going to start with my perspective of this race, equity, diversity, and inclusion work. I really think that no matter how many experts you hire, how many resources you provide, how many book clubs you form, um, if we don't start with self-awareness and have empathy, like our culture is not really going to change. I think it's just so important for us to have an open mind and to really listen to people of color stories, but not only listen, to actually believe them, right? Um, and put yourself in their shoes um, and really have empathy to start to change the culture. But with that being said, Kaufman did not start with self-awareness training, so um, we are doing that now, which we hired a amazing Dr. Kevin Sansbury, who is starting with the self-awareness work that we probably needed to start with. But as you know, that's why our title is Two Steps Forward and One Step Back. We're learning in this journey, and we have a lot of work to do. But um, Kaufman has been very intentional and inclusive since we started this work um, of asking opinions of all, of so all associates on almost everything that we do that has to do with race equity um, and, and obviously, as we know, everything has to do with race, equity, diversity, and inclusion in our lives, personally and professionally. Um, so one of, the, what, one of the things that we did is, um, as Corey mentioned, we established a ready change team. Um, and that consisted of like 23 associates, um, very diverse, diverse backgrounds, um, diverse perspectives, um, also power dynamics, and how we chose that team is um, the organization that we were working with, people volunteered. So first we did post it on our intranet on Courtyard to see who was interested to be in this Ready Change team. And this Ready Change team, the purpose of it was to provide more feedback on what Kaufman needed to do on this journey. And so we meet monthly. But before selecting the volunteers, the organization actually interviewed the people that volunteered. Just number one, to make it diverse, as I mentioned, and we wanted to have champions in this work and people that were most excited and positive about it. 
Um, so we do have that Ready Change team now, and we meet once a month, and it's just great for our journey. Our next process was our Race, Equity, and Diversity Inclusion Credo and Statement. Um, that was very inclusive as well. We posted it on the internet for a volunteer for a committee at the beginning. Um, the committee started the process, but every single associate at Kaufman had input on this ready credo and statement that we created. Um, it took us about six months for the final uh, product, and then it was presented to the board of directors in June. Um, and to be honest, prior to June and presenting this race credo and statement, I'm not even sure that our board of directors were aware of this race, equity, diversity, and inclusion journey that Kaufman was on. So that was a big step to present that ready credo and statement to the board because they really approved it and they, they really appreciated um, the words that were in the credo. So I think basically that's the two steps forward that I really think that we're very proud of because it was very inclusive of all associates and now we know that our board of directors are on board with this. I would add one thing. Yes. The credo and statement is actually the second one that was created. Because there was a first one created by one person alone in their office and then was given to us to see what we thought of it. And we were like, wait, you wrote our, the six of us who've been working on this for a year, you wrote the statement and now you're gonna just hand it to us? And so the team idea really came out of we, did, we pushed back slightly on that one. That was a bad day. Um, and then we made a really great choice. And I think the team, like Veronica said, the team led that to be something I think that will be very powerful. I think a lot of people make the statements and put the black squares on Instagram or whatever you do to make people think that you're doing this work. And I think ours, the difference between the first one is I think the first one was that it was performative. And then I think the second one is our commitment as an entire foundation to doing the work. So I, the people who led that put in so much time and effort and so many loops of feedback for all of us to make sure. And we deliberated over every single word in our credo because now it's what we're, we say are our values and what we say we're gonna live by. So we love the credo, the second yeah. one. Thank you, and actually I'll share the credo. The statement is pretty long, but um, our credo is, as stewards of you and Marion Kaufman's legacy, our work is grounded in truth, racial equity, and learning. We will pursue impact, guided by dignity, humor, grace, humility, and openness. And, and as I mentioned, the statement is even longer, but it's very powerful, and mainly because it was created by our associates. So I get to end with some of our L's, or could be losses, could be lessons, depending on how you want to, to view them. Um, there's been several um, that, you know, missteps that we've had over the last three years of being engaged in this work, but I'll just give, you know, three or four high level ones that really have, you know, been sitting with us as, as we've talked about our full journey. Um, and several of them have already been alluded to, but I think one of the, the big missteps that we made initially in starting to do this work is not having um, leadership fully invested and bought in out the gate. Um, as we know, at every level of leadership, in order for this work to truly be prioritized and actually uh, happening on every level, it is something that everybody needs to be a part of, and leadership definitely sets the tone and not only prioritizes in the work on their individual teams, but then also setting the example of what this work looks like in practice, and also accountability if folks choose not to engage in this work, letting people know what that looks like and if there's going to be any negative consequences or impact of folks that choose to not fully engage in the work or be on the journey at all. And so having that leadership buy-in, engagement, endorsement, um, of every level, board level, leadership, all of those things are very important. Um, and it's now something that we have years into the work, but initially we certainly did not have that. And we see that our work was definitely stalled initially. And I think we may have been a lot further maybe in the work if we had gotten that initial endorsement early on. 
Another thing, we were so ex excited, like most of the country who was engaging in these DEI efforts over the last few years. And once we got the support to move forward with the work, we were really excited. And in our haste, we really jumped in without a lot of direction, without a lot of structure, without a lot of strategy. I know strategy sometimes can often be a stall tactic for choosing not to move forward in the work. Um, and a strategy, I think, is something in this in this work is really actually important um, because one of the biggest pieces of pushback that we tend to get on this journey is where is this going? Um, what are we ultimately trying to have happen? And so without having those goals, without having the structure and strategy, I think it jaded a lot of folks who were actually excited about being on the journey. It led to, you know, some strain on, on our small team and us having to lead and carry a lot of that work without that initial endorsement by leadership. And then it also led to, I would say, a lot of harm that was done when we engaged in some of those conversations because there was no plan for where it was headed. So a lot of people were having to relive traumatic stories and experiences and over and over and over again with no plan. So I would say that that was another misstep that we made. Um, along the journey, we start making a shift to actually be more inclusive uh, in and I say that in air quotes, be inclusive in, in the work. So in the decision making, writing the statements, hiring for different roles. And so it was something that was said that we were doing, but it's not actually something that translated to, into practice. And so I would say that that is another misstep that we made, saying that we are actually going to be inclusive in our work and in our efforts without actually taking the added steps to include the folks that are most and directly impacted by by the work that we are doing firsthand. And we have some really, really good examples of how that was not done well, but I will save those for, um, for another time. And then the last piece that I would like to focus on that I think was a big misstep for us, um, earlier on we did jump right in with wanting to level set and do all of the terminology and making sure that folks were on the same page about what a lot of the terms and language, uh, what we were meaning. Um, but I think in doing that, we put more emphasis on the knowledge building, the skill building, and the things like that, which really only impact behaviors initially and don't do a lot for impacting uh, systems and structures, which is ultimately the work that we're trying to get to in order to change mindsets and change shift from mindset into action. And so I would say we are still in the place of wanting to shift to action uh, at the foundation, but I think you definitely need to have the skill building and the knowledge building, and it has to be accompanied with that other work as well. They can't be done in isolation. So one of our missteps is just making, um, choosing to focus on one end of the spectrum instead of the other one. So I'm hoping over this next year, when we do re return back to work together in person, we can actually do both of those things in concert with one another. So those are just a few high level missteps. Again, we have many um, and we realize that all of this is a part of the journey. The, the moments when we do things well, the moments that we do have missteps, um, but I do appreciate the moments where we have had missteps. They have been acknowledged, they have been addressed, and we have taken great feedback to make sure we're not repeating some of the same mistakes and harming folks in the process. And I, if you guys want to think of some questions, we're going to get there in one second. But as Tanisha was talking, I was thinking about how the three of us, in, you know, systems of racism were set up systemically and very strategically in very thoughtful ways. And to get rid of them, it's also going to require a lot of strategy and thoughtfulness. And so one of the things the three of us did was the meeting after the meeting. And so like when something would go wrong and Veronica would send a text or something, they would be like, okay, well, what about this? Who's going to say it? And oftentimes, white people, it's our job, right? Most of the time, there was harm done. It was done by white people. And then it was going to be my responsibility getting leads from these two as to what I should do. But it's going to have to come out of my mouth to make sure that white people are calling out white people. Um, and that was something I actually think we were super effective <laughs> at, was just making sure that there was real strategy as to when a mistake was addressed, 
who it was going to be addressed by and how we were going to work together behind the scenes to make sure that it, it didn't just get glossed over. And so we were really good at that part. And I think that that's something really important, especially for white people to think about is what is your role in this work? And, and you're gonna have to say the hard stuff and you're gonna, my friend Sharif always says, allies take up space and accomplices take up risk. And really your job is to take up risk. Um, and that has, I think that's something that we do pretty well. I think oh, I, I'll add to that though. I think what's important as well is that um, we are used to working in white dominant culture and so I think that it is time for black and brown people to speak up in meetings and just um, let others hear our own story and our own voice because I think that you know having an ally is wonderful but that's one of the issues is that we are always quiet in meetings because we are the minority per se, right? And so our stories and our ideas never get listened to. And if we continue to stay quiet, um, that's going to continue. So I'm starting to use my voice more often, although it shakes and I get nervous. But I think that it's important for us to start um, voicing our experiences and um, our ideas. I see you have a microphone. Does anyone have a question for us? Hi. <clears throat> wow. Hi, my name is Angela Romans, and um, quick, I've been a DAI consultant for the past couple of years, and um, will likely be working with the Kaufman Foundation around some of your coaching. Um, can you tell me how you balanced the use of consultants to support versus or with the internal capacity building that your staff needed to take on? So like when and where was a consultant most useful and how did they help you build your own capacity to sustain the work? That's a really good question and a really important question because I don't actually think we got it right necessarily. But we did a whole year with just the six of us and like reading. That is not the way to go. That is not the way to go, I don't think. And again, by the way, we're also not telling anyone about your journey. We're just giving you what we did and, you know, it's a way, it's not the way by any stretch of the imagination, but we waited a year before we really got consultants and then we actually debated forever about what their job was and was their job gonna be to lead the work or was their job gonna be to train us and then our job was gonna be to, to lead the work. I don't actually think we ever got that right. Um, and I think we agreed that they were going to train us and we were gonna do the work and then they actually did the work, not us. Um, and again, that's just because we were flying by the seat of our pants and trying to do what we thought. But it, it wasn't until 2019, it was an entire year after we had started us doing PD uh, with no skills to speak of, uh, then we had them. And then we actually had the same consultants for two years and then they kind of cycled out and now we have a different consultant um, who, well, Kevin, he does, more, um, I think he does more, again, we're at a different place, right? Like where we were when we started with Michelle and Aaron is very different than where we are now. And so I think Kevin does more small group work versus whole foundation work. And I think that that has a totally different flavor too, because, the, because our work is done in caucuses now rather than just full foundation. Yeah, I would agree with, I think we've landed more with our consultant support being one that helps us and empowers us to be able to own the work. Um, and so a lot of times we have a lot of great ideas and we would look to the consultant to help us bring it to life. And so I think I think the, the, the best use of the consultants to me that we, where we've been the most impactful is when they've helped us uh, they've empowered us and say, hey, you all have everything that you need. You've been working with us for two years now. Nobody is going to be as invested as you all. And so we can only do so much, take it and run with it. And so they would also have those kind of higher level conversations with leadership as well that we weren't uh, privy to. But I think them empowering us was the most impactful. And you know, we didn't say, but now as you're saying it, something else that happened with these consultants is all of us six of us on the small team, we got race coaches, personal race coaches to do our own 
personal work ourselves. And so that was going on simultaneously. So we were getting our own development while they were, you know, helping everyone else. And I thought, that, and obviously what Tanisha needs is very different than what I need and what I'm working on. And I think those kind of things were super helpful to us. And we now work, um, well, we're starting next week. How many people are going to get the coaching? 15. So we're going to provide this ready coaching to all associates eventually. So we're starting a pilot um, that starts next week with 15 associates for this ready coaching. Um, we feel like it was very beneficial for our ready change team. So we would like for every associate to benefit from that as well. Catalyst Ed is our provider, and Leona is amazing if you know her. Can you talk a little bit about the people who didn't want to come on that journey and what, um, what, how you handled that? Because they just, again, when you look at even this room, it's mostly people of color, right? And getting white people to care about this as a primary motivator to fix culture. I think is just a ubiquitous problem across all sectors, um, even at this conference. And so um, I'm just curious to know how you, what did you do? <laughs> I would say that it is, I've seen it vary by department and I've seen it vary by um, the person in leadership who's over certain departments. It definitely has been uh, something that has been debated. There has been a number of mainly white associates who have definitely been more resistant uh, to the work. And it's something that's been observed by a lot of people. We've seen people who after a year of doing the work would sit in sessions and not have anything to say for an entire year. Um, and so I don't think that the foundation has come to the place where it's like you either get on board or, you ought, or, you, or you're no longer working here. But I think the thinking has been if we get enough people that do get behind this work, this will eventually become a place where you're no longer comfortable unless you're choosing to be on the journey with us. So that's kind of where we are now. And I would just emphasize caucus work, even though it was my worst nightmare now that I was going to be in a room with all white people doing race and equity work, which is the last place that I want to be, but it is the place that I need to be, I understand. Um, in our caucuses, I mean, there will be five people of the 70 talking, and there will be 65 people saying nothing. It has gotten better. It, has, it is slow change work, but getting all of us out of the other spaces I think is a really key way if you're gonna, because the other thing is you have to meet people where they are. Unfortunately, that's the truth, right? And so you might not like where people are, but you have to meet them there. And so in the white caucus spaces, that's what we get to do is meet people where they are. So of course, we always have the little conversations afterwards, like how was your caucus, how was your caucus? Um, and mine is always very different <laughs> than their experiences in the caucuses, but, but it does provide safe space that I think if people are going to get on the journey at all, it's going to be in that space. I will also add, we do have an all associate training on a monthly basis, as we mentioned, and they are required. So as Tanisha mentioned, like depending on senior leadership, if they do notice that one of their associates did not attend, um, you know, a lot of them will, you know, focus on them and just en encourage them to attend. So that's another thing. They are required sessions and we do notice who's there. Yep. We're getting the, we have to wrap it up signal. So if anyone wants, if there's a more questions and you want to see us afterwards, we'd be happy to give you our contact information and keep this conversation going. Cause again, we just are here cause we love our foundation and we care about it. And when you love and care about something, sometimes you got to beat it up um, to make it better. And we're just sharing that story with you guys today.